necessity and the challenge, challenges faced as militaries move towards deeper integration. The session is chaired by Lieutenant General Anil Ahuja, TBSM, UYSM, AVSM, SM, VSM bar retired. General Ahuja is a former Deputy Chief of the Integrated Defence Staff for Policy Planning and Force Development. He commanded a corps and a division in the Eastern Theatre. He has also been the additional Director General Military Operation. He served as the Defence Attaché to Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos and was a UN Military Observer in Angola. He was the founding co-chair of India-US DTTI Interagency Task Force and has been the member secretary of Defense Acquisition Council during the period 2014 till 2016. General Ahuja will be delivering a talk on the need for integration to fight future wars. The first speaker on the panel is Major General Rick Mick Ryan, AM, former commandant, Australian Defense College. Major General Mick Ryan graduated from the Royal Military College, Duntrun, in 1989. Career highlights prior to unit command include serving with the 6th Infantry Battalion Group in East Timor, being the lead planner for development of the first ADF network-centric warfare roadmap. In January 2013, he was appointed the Director General Strategic Plans in Army Headquarters. During his time in the appointment, he was responsible for Army's contribution to the Defense White Paper and Force Structure Review. He's a distinguished graduate of the United States Marine Corps Command and Staff College. He holds a master's in international public policy from John Hopkins University. General Ryan will be speaking on integration challenges in a multi-domain landscape. Our second speaker for the session is Lieutenant General Raj Shukla, PVSM, YSM, SM, ADC, GOCNC, Army Training Command. In a career spanning four decades, the officer has seen extensive service in the field. He commanded an infantry division along the line of control in the valley, and a pivot corps along the western borders. The general officer has served two tenures at the Military Operations Directorate, dealing with doctrines, force structuring, until recently was the director general of the erstwhile perspective planning, now strategic planning, addressing issues relating to military futures and forces modernization. He has also been the commandant of the Indian Army's prestigious training establishment and think tank, the Army War College. The general officer, is currently the 22nd General Officer Commanding-in-Chief of the Indian Army's Army Training Command. General Raj Shukla will be speaking on World Order and Future Joint Force. I will now request the Chairperson to commence the session with his remarks. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Gambir. At the outset, let me thank uh, Lieutenant General Dr. V.K. Aluwalia Director Claus for giving us the opportunity to be part of these deliberations. I'm also privileged to be part of this panel with my two distinguished co-panelists, Major General Mick Ryan and Lieutenant General Raj Shukla, who've already been introduced. I also appreciate the opportunity to be with a vast spectrum of participants and I look forward to benefiting from your collective wisdom. Now, we've had a rich discussion over the last two days, discerning the contours of future wars and identifying the possible countermeasures that our armed forces and, in fact, the entire nation need to take to prepare for, to contest our adversaries in multiple domains. Now, in the previous four sessions, we've looked at evolving global and uh, regional strategic landscape. We looked at emerging path-breaking disruptive technologies, which are enhancing operational capability across expanding domains for which our future leaders and commanders must be trained. And as Lieutenant General Mary Bell just highlighted in the previous section, trained and educated. We've seen that the battlefield, which extends beyond the classic description of battlefields, as we were talking yesterday while discussing the future wars, 
Now, in this changing environment, the battlefield is characterized by two major developments. One, development of newer generation of weapons and battle support systems. And two, advancements in technology in an environment being described as military disruptions or artificial intelligence driven revolution in military affairs. Jal Sabarwal covered this extensively in earlier session today morning. Now these advancements have given us enhanced capability to operate across multiple domains beyond our classic land, sea and air domain. Now cyberspace and electromagnetic and psychological domains, which hitherto provided us only an enabling environment, today constitute separate domains in themselves, in which comprehensive competition and comprehensive wars are being waged. The newer weapons and technologies enable the planners to rapidly hop across domains during the course of the conflict at speeds faster than the human brains can think. So the success of multi-domain operation lies in our ability to integrate and operate dynamically across these domains, which should be seamlessly integrated through evolved concept of operations and through application of technology. So rightly, this final session is devoted to stitching all this together, to integration in multi domain landscape. In this session, we'll be covering three aspects. I'll briefly cover the need for integration to fight future wars. Uh, Major General Mick Ryan will cover the challenges to multi domain integration. And finally, Lieutenant General Raj Shukla will cover the world order and future joint force. I'll request the panelists to confine their remarks to not more than 15 minutes. And Gambhir, please remind me if I overshoot. Now, coming to the need for integration to fight future multi domain wars, let me touch on three aspects. One, why jointness is not enough and the need to integrate. Two, what does integration entail in our context? And three, some pointers for going ahead. Now, why jointness is not enough? Ladies and gentlemen, jointness and integration are terms often used interchangeably. These terms define the state of functioning between the three services. 50 years back in 1971, when India successfully conducted the war for liberation of Bangladesh, we operated jointly on land, air and sea. While we were operationally successful, but we were far from being integrated as is being conceptualized today. In fact, jointness largely remains the mode of functioning even now. But with the advent of the concept of multi-domain operations and the ongoing animated discussion that we are having in our country on integrated military commands in India, we actually need to ask ourselves as to what really ails our current system of functioning jointly and why what is the real need calling upon us to integrate urgently? Is it the number? Is it the number of commands? 17 single service disparate commands, which being too many need to be reduced to a fewer, more economical number or five. Now, this is the most common logic being peddled. I use this word carefully. 
in public utterances. To my mind, there are at least five major drawbacks in the current system of functioning jointly, which impact our operational efficiency. These are one, there being only a loose overarching political directive, the military planning remains largely compartmentalized. Two, the operational planning is based on single service perception of national security and national defense policy. Is the Army's perception, Navy's perception, or the Air Force perception? The orchestration of operations and employment of assets of each service is based on particular services doctrinal thinking with no operational inter-service integration. We see this, uh, this uh, aspect of individual service doctrinal thinking in our discussions with Air Force a number of times. Uh, I, I speak this as an army man. Four, there's absence of an authority at the command level or even at the apex level to institutionally coordinate inter-service plans to force individual service to reconcile perceptions and expectations towards a broader operational and strategic objective. What better example than the Kargil conflict where we had the same operation given Op Vijay by the Army and Op Safed Sagar by Air Force. And then finally, there's the lack of integrated C4 ISR resulting in neither having common intelligence picture, nor sensors, nor networks across all the services. And there's inadequate availability of commanders and staff trained in integrated multi-domain environment. And our concepts and doctrines are yet to be adequately integrated. These aspects were highlighted by the three chiefs in their remarks yesterday. Now the cyberspace and information domains are concerned while basic structures have, uh, have started coming up. We have a long way to go in integrating these with the services. And as would be realized, the system of jointness is perfectly fine while we fight within the service, but it's not suited to dynamic cross-domain operations where decision cycles and reaction times are compressed and each layer of response may lie in different domain. The second reason why we need to graduate to integration is because of the change in scope and context of wars. Though the armed forces remain the principal instrument of war fighting, the scope of present day wars extends well beyond the tactical and operational military context to broader geopolitical and strategic competition. Through small tactical military actions along the borders or in disputed areas, Country, countries actually aim to dissuade and deter than seek conventional military victories in terms of territorial or numerical gains. 14 rounds of India-China military talks, numerous working mechanism for consultation and coordination, WMCC diplomatic meetings, interactions at ministerial level, which have not yet succeeded in diffusing the standoff in Ladakh. All this goes to confirm the hypothesis of wars being based to achieve larger national aims well beyond only military objectives. Now, even in the gray zone operations or localized tactical military actions of salami, spe uh, salami slicing, that we commonly talk of in the context of our borders with China or the Chinese military activities in South China Sea. 
Now, even these extend well beyond being mere military actions. These are well thought out ground level manifestation of a larger intent of psychological dislocation and dissuasion. Now, let's look at the deeper thought of picking up salamis to be sliced or the so-called cabbage tactics to be employed. Now, these salamis are well thought out, limited objectives and are selected to present a fate accompli to the defender. Next, that the objective is so selected that it does not provoke major escalation. The cumulative gains are secured over a period of time, slice by slice, at minimal cost by tactical level actions, which actually have strategic objectives. Changes made by the aggressor are such that these cannot be undone without direct military confrontation, the onus of which is now shifted to the defender. And the salamis are so selected that the target country's reversal attempt would be costlier, both operationally and politically, than acquiescence. To definitely respond to such actions, we need multi-domain integration, which enables synergizing EW, cyber, space, psychological operation, as well as managing growing number of sophisticated gray zone threats. Coming to the second aspect of what does integration entail? It entails employing military capability in concert with other instruments of national power for a whole of nation approach. It entails reliance on harnessing sensor system and networks to generate comprehensive cross domain picture and employ smarter weapons. Now it entails reliance on harnessing sensor systems and networks to generate comprehensive cross domain picture and employ smarter weapons. Look, there is one aspect since this integration is largely virtual and unseen involving systems and networks, it allows developing greater integration and interoperability with strategic partners without political and diplomatic fallout. This may be worth keeping at the back of our mind as we develop interoperability in the Indo-Pacific. Jill Mick Ryan is welcome to comment on this particular aspect. Now it restricts full freedom of action of armed forces across all domains, necessitating the need to synchronize with national level structures of cyber space, technical intelligence and internal security. This adds extra layers and there are challenges of trust, culture and inertia. For this, we need to evolve a concept of operating around this. And the most significant tem uh, tenant of multi-domain integration is achieving information advantage to sense, understand and orchestrate operations across domains and to maintain a common situational awareness. In this, cloud is the foundation of this effort by leveraging cloud architecture and by defining authorization and access to both civil and military networks, information can flow rapidly from sensors to soldiers on ground, and it also enables countering adversaries effectively in the huge cognitive space. And in the context of evolving organizational structure, the integration is required to be achieved at the apex level or the national level where the overarching MDO policy and the strategy must be formulated and coordinated across political, military, diplomatic, economic and other domains and policy decisions with respect to equipment acquisition, joint training, domain balance or domain bias must be taken at this level. 
as is well known to this audience in china such integration is carried out at the level of cmc and the central commission for integrated military and civil development and by the national defense management center in russia so in essence what you require is national security strategy formulation and implementation group at the apex level a notch below this there are various models available for exercising multi domain functional control in pla we have the strategic support force the british army has division 6 77 brigade for conduct of hybrid warfare focusing on isr cyber and information operations these formations in uk are manned by nearly 50% reservists the russian army has focused its multi domain integration on battalion tactical groups in 2014 ukraine conflict uh the battalion tactical groups included advanced radar guidance surface to air missiles uavs and ew capability now each country based on its size geography footprint threat perception and technological capability would need to look at its own organizational construct due to the building blocks required to be put into the place this would need to be phased the us modernization strategy is aiming to create organizations capable of conducting multi domain operations in single theater by 2028 and in multiple theaters by 2035 we'll also have to consider phased operations and finally i come to a possible way ahead for india let me leave a few pointers general uta very... i would request you to please sum up your talk 2 okay. minutes at the very outset we need to evolve national strategy and joint doctrine for integrating national assets and stakeholders this should form the basis of formulating a new union war book which institutionally integrates armed forces with various other verticals the apex level integration can be done at national security council secretariat secretariat where the direction of ccs can be implemented to integrate all agencies diplomats intelligence capf space cyber etc the next level of integration should come at headquarter ids level and we need to get over the anathema of cds not being an operational commander we'll have to restructure the headquarters to take this on and the organizational construct of theater commands it has to be evolved in phases over 3 to 4 years there's need to create training and education facilities and we also need to work on building our interoperability with strategic partners uh, across the subcontinent and in the indo pacific these are some pointers i have finished and may i now invite general mick ryan to give his remarks on the integration challenges in multi domain landscape thank you, sir i really enjoyed your comments there and thank you to the whole team for inviting me to participate in this wonderful conference and and tracking some of the conversations over the last day or so it's been very insightful uh as as asked I will I'll talk briefly on some of the challenges uh for multi domain uh operations in the 21st century uh I do have some slides I'll just say next but I'll talk to them uh but I think it's uh, more important that uh I get through my presentation uh, for the Lieutenant General and for the Q and A at the back. Um, I, I would say at the start that over the over the last century, the domains in which humans have fought have constantly expanded. Uh, for thousands of years, we fought on the land and a little bit on the sea. Uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, that expanded into the air, and in the late 20th, 20th century, that expanded again into cyberspace and to real space. and unlike the contingencies that many of us have been involved in in the last two decades uh, future military operations future national security operations will be conducted and must be conducted in all five of these domains concurrently so the 21st century really is about mobilizing all national resources in a more integrated way 
to conduct operations, kinetic and non-kinetic, across these domains. And I would say before I move on that competition, cooperation and conflict, which many institutions seem to portray as a spectrum, is not a spectrum, but it's a series of interrelated, integrated and concurrent activities. And that really drives a need for more integration. Next slide, please. So in this presentation, I'll quickly talk about the key trends that are driving greater integration in military institutions, uh, what others are doing about responding to these trends, and then very quickly cover off on some ideas about how we might be able to better integrate how we work together in the future. Next slide, please. So there, I think there are five trends that really challenge how we have seen military activities, how we have seen the integration of military activities with high level national security objectives in the 21st century. Uh, the first of these, slide please, is that we need to think differently about time in the 21st century. Slide please. Now there's several reasons for this. Firstly, uh, as many of the speakers have highlighted, uh, artificial intelligence and the big use of cloud and, and big data and edge computing changes the pace at which tactical operations might be conducted. Uh, it changes the pace which we might collect, analyze and disseminate information. Uh, but at the same time, new and emerging biotechnologies might speed up the pace of human activities as well, particularly in the tactical realm. And finally, uh, autonomous systems across uh, the land, uh, on the surface and under the sea and in the air are also potentially moving the pace of tactical operations beyond human comprehension. And what this does is not just speed up tactical activities, but may well compress the tactical to strategic continuum. Uh, that's a problem because many of our high level political and strategic organizations are still using processes and organizations uh, that emerged in the late 20th century. They're going to have to change. There's one final point I'd make about a different appreciation of change in the 21st century. Uh, over the last 100 years where military institutions have sought to, de to develop concepts which speed up the pace of tactical operations, often what they've done is resulted in longer wars. Uh, German Blitzkrieg is a great example of this and the US shock and awe in Iraq is another example. So we need to think differently about time in our integration operations. Next slide, please. The second trend challenging integration is we're in a new era of mass. This isn't the mass that Clausewitz or even our fathers and grandfathers uh, might've been used to in the mass conduct of military operations. That doesn't mean we won't be using lots of tanks and artillery and aircraft, but these will be supplemented by hundreds, thousands or tens of thousands of autonomous vehicles. Um, and we haven't really come up with good ways of operate, uh, operating them with humans in a way where they're true partners. And indeed, most of our training and education is all about humans. It's not about human machine teaming and that will need to change. But it's not just the physical realm where we're being challenged by this new era of mass. Uh, in the information realm, we're seeing the conduct of influence operations uh, at a pace uh, and of a scale and of a precision that's never been possible before in human history. So but in both the kinetic and non-kinetic realms, this new era of mass is challenging how we integrate our operations. Next slide, please. The third challenge is this evolving fight for influence. Now, I, I referred to this just very briefly in the previous challenge. Um, should be the previous slide, number three. Uh, but this capacity uh, that many, many organizations have now to collect information about people and then to conduct influence operations has really come to the fore in the last decade. In particular, we saw it used at a large scale for the 2016 presidential activities in the United States, and we've seen it uh, since then rolled out to complement uh, the coercive activities of countries in our region uh, and to our north, and we'll continue to see that. It is an ongoing challenge for the integration of operations, but also drives 
uh, the need for us to think carefully about where the information seams are in our operation, in our institutions, and in our very societies. Next slide, please. A, third, a fourth challenge for integration in the 21st century is what I call the battle of signatures. Everything has a signature, uh, whether it's uh, you can see a human, uh, whether it's heat, whether it's exhaust, uh, whether it's electromagnetic signatures. Uh, we've always met, we've measured these for a long time. It's why we do camouflage activities. It's why we do electronic warfare and these kind of things. But in the 21st century, uh, the proliferation of both civil and military cheap network sensors uh, allows a larger proportion of the globe to be seen in more detail than ever before. And we're seeing this play out right now in the Russian buildup around the periphery of Ukraine. Probably never before have we seen in real time almost the buildup of a large scale military force uh, with potential to invade another country as we've seen on social media. Now that doesn't uh, indicate will, but it indicates capability and capacity. Uh, and we need to understand this uh, as one of the challenges to integration in the 21st century. It's not just a tactical undertaking, however. Uh, strategic signature management is a really important skill for military organizations to understand. For example, what are the signatures of an amphibious task group that might want to deploy in the Western Pacific? Next slide, please. And the final challenge for integration in the 21st century is human machine teaming. Uh, as I referred to a short while ago, all our training and education systems are designed to produce human leaders, human soldiers, sailors, airmen and women. Um, they often train people to use equipment or tools. We've been doing that since the first caveman picked up a rock. The reality is, however, some of the new autonomous and lethal autonomous systems are capable of teaming in the in the truest meaning of the word with human beings. Very few of our concepts, none of our training and education really covers what this means. Uh, for my own organisation in the Australian Defence Force, we probably have one autonomous system for every hundred people. Uh, over the coming years, you will see that ratio flip where individuals will be controlling dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of autonomous systems in a team. How do we prepare our people for that? And how do we ensure our adversaries aren't able to exploit the gaps in those kind of capabilities? Next slide. So they're the challenges I think we need to contend with as, as we move forward thinking about a more integrated system, a military system and a more integrated military with national security endeavors. What are others doing? Next slide, please. Well, I think uh, the pace at the moment really is being set by the Chinese and the Russians. Um, we, there are a lot of open source documents about how the PLA and the Russian military is thinking about 21st century warfare. Um, we've seen the Chinese uh, science of military art documents and other concepts come out in the last uh, few years. Uh, systems thinking is very powerful in the Chinese military. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a case study in a moment. But also the Russians have come a long way uh, with their national security strategy in July last year, which talks about an integrated use of national power in achieving their national end states. These strategies of active, de active defense and limited action are all about this new Russian approach to integrated operations across their military uh, to government interfaces. Next slide, please. So if we to have a quick look at how the Chinese think about integration, um, they have a deep culture in, in thinking about deception, stratagems, and these kind of things. And these are integrated across their organizations. Uh, but in the last 20 years, there have been significant changes in how they do think about military operations and integration and systems thinking have been very important to this. Uh, key elements of their way of thinking uh, for the Chinese, uh, new age concepts, obtaining a strategic advantage, establishing control of all types across all domains, um, psychological actions integrated with uh, physical actions, uh, system sabotage at vital points, swarm operations, and a focus on AI and quantum uh, technologies, including quantum encrypted 
communications to secure uh, how they integrate their operations. Next slide, please. And this AI and war has really come to dominate how the Chinese think about warfare in the 21st century. We need to appreciate it because it's one of the key mechanisms by which they use to integrate their operations across tactical forces, across the joint force, and between the joint force and the uh, CMC based team in Beijing and the new joint staff directorate that's there as well. Um, they talk about intelligent power as being the most crucial factor in determining war's outcome. Uh, and that, that, that will also involve attrition warfare, breaking down systems with the application of intelligence swarms, cross domain mobile warfare, uh, cognition control warfare, all become basic parts of combat uh, in this evolved PLA thinking about war and competition. Next slide, please. But it's also important to understand the PLA have this concept of systems confrontation where not only do they seek to assure the integration of their own systems, uh, they seek to break down the integration of adversary systems through this concept of system destruction warfare. There's a wonderful report from RAN published over the last couple of years. It's open, open source online, and I commend it to you all, where it examines how the PLA thinks about um, warfare through a systems approach and ensuring they use that systems approach to break down the systems of the enemy. I mean, there's an old saying in the army where we talk about the enemy will always attack at the join in the maps. Uh, this is just that same concept taken to its large scale 21st century artificial intelligence enabled end state. Next slide, please. But obviously it's not just the Russians or the PLA who are thinking about integration in the 21st century. The US and the UK have both uh, issued really interesting concepts that look at more integrated approaches over the last few years uh, for the British. Uh, they've issued in 2020 their integrated operating concept. I commend it to you. It's about military institutions and their organisational mechanisms to integrate better with national power. At the same time, this concept of mosaic warfare, that's one particular publication on the screen there from the Centre for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments in Washington, D.C. It's about the US military being able to generate rapid speed and simultaneous operations that break down an adversary's facility for timely and effective decision making. Now, I don't think that's anything new in warfare as a concept, but the mechanism by which they seek to do that is new and mirrors in some respects the PLA's concept of systems destruction warfare. Next slide, please. And there are other challenges uh, besides just attacking an adversary system. I mean, when we design our own forces, how much integration uh, really is required and how much connectivity and bandwidth will be needed to enable that. And at the end of the day, what really needs to be connected? Does everything need to be connected to everything or do we need to be more judicious in what we connect so we can preserve bandwidth and we can protect the execution of mission command at the tactical level where it's most important? And finally, how much integration is required between military forces and the other elements of national security? It's not just integrating joint forces, uh, as other speakers have highlighted. It really is about integrated military force with other arms of national security and national power. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'd like to conclude my presentation. I request you to try and conclude, please. How we might be able to achieve 21st century integration Next slide, please. First, uh, I just call this Ryan's equation for uh, integrated strategic advantage, and I'll go through these uh, very quickly. Next slide, please. Firstly, it's vital we produce new ways of thinking about joint and integrated warfare. Some of the ideas that we've used for 100 years are just not going to work anymore, particularly as we rebalance our investment in non-kinetic operations, especially with influence and cyber warfare, and new kinetic ways of doing business, particularly in space, uh, high altitude warfare, uh, subterranean and subsea warfare. Next slide, please. It'll require uh, us to come up with uh, new theories of victory in this integrated approach. Next slide. 
Uh, the second part of my equation is we're going to need new and evolved organisations. Now, this, this is nothing new. Uh, military organisations have always evolved and adapted and formed new organisations as new technologies and new operational challenges have arisen. And we're going to have to keep doing that in the 21st century. Recent examples uh, are the Strategic Support Force in the PLA in 2015 and the US Space Force in 2019. We're all going to have to think deeply about new ways of organising to be better integrated and more successful. Next slide, please. General Ryan, may I request you to try and wind up, please? Yes, sure. Um, just uh, three more quick ones. Uh, we'll need to think differently about uh, effective military operations and, and how we how we do business. And uh, there are lots of great scholarly articles on how we might define military effectiveness in the 21st century, but it must incorporate integrated operations. Next slide. Second last, we need to be better at developing uh, an integrated intellectual edge where we train and educate our people for this new uh, integrated environment. Uh, next slide, please which will require us to uh, do our education, not just uh, in a joint construct, but with other elements of national security, other people from government. Uh, we must make sure we're teaching our people to work with AI and autonomous systems, and that they're collaborating more with industry and academia. Next slide. And finally, to generate an integrated force purpose is so important. Um, we can task people, but it is purpose that inspires our people. And it doesn't matter how technologically advanced uh, each age is, this will be uh, critical to integrated operations at every single level. It will require good analytical and communication skills and no robot or AI will ever be able to provide purpose to humans. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. It's been a real honor to present uh, at this seminar uh, and back to you, sir. Uh, thank you, General Ryan. You have uh, very comprehensively presented the challenges involved in integration. And uh, we really found it very interesting when you gave the characteristics of 21st century operations. Uh, you started by highlighting to everyone that continuation, uh, competition, cooperation, confrontation, they are not separate they are just a continuation of each the five trends that you highlighted about time mass influence signatures and uh, now human machine integration now this is the crux of the thing and we really found it interesting uh what is of particular relevance to us is what china is doing of course, what uh, Russia is doing and uh, the RAND report that you referred to system confrontation and system destruction warfare. I think it will be interest to our participants. We'll definitely have a look at it and you covered the challenges very comprehensively. Uh, getting into the nuts and bolts of what we need to connect, how much we need to connect and to integrate intellectually. Thank you very much for uh, very informative uh, remarks. Thank you. And now, may I call upon General Shukla to kindly give his remarks. Over to General Shukla, please. Um, okay, Director Claus, uh, Lieutenant General V.K. Aluwalia, fellow panelists, General Ahuja and Mayor General Mick Ryan, distinguished delegates to this conference, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I've been tasked to explore the possible contours sinews of a joint force in the context of our strategic military futures. So let me try and address the subject in terms of three key posers or postulates. These posers also constitute the structure of my talk. Military power can only be leveraged in a given strategic context. I shall begin therefore by first and foremost attempting to establish the parameters of the likely strategic context of the future. It is critical that we get the context right. I shall then try and see as to what kind of paradigm and jointness do we need to maximize our operational effectiveness in the evolving strategic context. In all humility, jointness attributes not for a bygone era, but those that are relevant and salient 
to our strategic military futures. H how do we, what do we need to do to make this transition or more accurately, a, the transformation to this new paradigm? It cannot be tinkering or incrementalism and the institutional jostling that en ensues and that abounds in the context of jointness reform, these incremental concessions to just about allow the status quo to alter a wee bit. Frankly, that's what's happening. That's why our jointness paradigm is not taking off. So not incremental concessions, concessions, but a genuine and huge leap of faith. That is what we need. One that is driven not by the power of hierarchy or high office, but by a larger collective realization of the intrinsic logic of integration and the abundant payoffs from em embracing change. So that is really the theme of my talk. If we do that, it should lead us to the contours of the aspirational joint force that we need to configure and which very many adversaries and competitors are already doing. So the choice is before us. The strategic military identity that we need to grow and embrace to help make, uh, to help us make the successful transition from the industrial age defined by platforms to the digital information age, one defined by systems and niche capacities that we are now in. So that is really the, 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 the central theme of my talk. The, how do we make this effective transition from industrial era proficiencies to the challenges of the digital age? The emerging strategic context. Now the future in my view is a maze of strategic uncertainties. Making sense of them Predicting their trajectories is always a hazardous proposition. Yet such crystal grazing is intrinsic to the profession of arms. So no, no matter how hard we try and how sharp our calibration, the future will always surprise us. Nevertheless, from a broad study of global trends, it does appear that India's strategic military futures, and now I will narrow down to the Indian context, will be defined by a few distinctive metrics. One, on current evidence, it does seem that the strategic adversity around or about India will only grow and accumulate and in an exponential sort of way. There is the gathering Chinese storm to the north. What is particularly worrying is not so much the attempts at territorial creep that we see along the LAC. We have rebalanced well and are strong and robust enough to cope with the numerous variants of this territorial creep. So not so much the LAC but the larger power dynamic that underlines China's rise, which is a cause for concern. The depth and staggering scale of ambition in its strategic ideation. It's commonly believed that China implements well. I argue that it ideates far better, and that is what should worry us. And the military juggernaut that is being created in consequence of this superior ideation, both in the Western Theater Command and the IOR. The combat structures and capacities are very potent, all driven by some very agile bureaucracies acutely focused on deliverance, some very energetic military diplomacy, and a phenomenal enterprise of civil military fusion. India's western horizons are also in a state of strategic flux. The geostrategic void created by the American pullout from Afghanistan, amongst other factors, means that a new set of factors and axes will now take root and acquired salience, they already are. China, Pakistan, Taliban, Iran, and all that that we see. Pan-Turkism is growing. There is every sign that the terror threat will recoalesce. And if that were not enough, nations are now projecting power and injecting sophisticated capacities into cyberspace. The next 9-11 may, may well be one that challenges our strategic imagination, and it may come from the cyber domain. Now, the net consequence of the accumulating strategic adversary is this, that we will need to strengthen our instrument of force, the Indian military, across the spectrum of conflict, from counter-terror to conventional capacities to high-end strategic systems. There does not seem to be any way we can escape this grim reality. Two, the strategic military landscape of the future will be, as many speakers have said, increasingly multi-domain in nature, in nature, which means that proficiencies in the emerging domains, space, cyber, EW, IW, missilery, hypersonics, 
and those being transformed by disruptive technology, the many facets of digital combat will be just as salient, if not more salient, as prowess in the primary domains of land, air, and sea. Dubbing the emerging domains as mere enablers, in my view, will be a costly mistake. And this is something I would reiterate because it just does seem to be the common wisdom. Yes, that these things are important, but that they are merely enablers. They are transforming war. Three, there is much talk about the great changes in the character of war. We all acknowledge that. That is indeed a reality. But the most distinctive trend that I see is a dramatic surge towards ambiguity, such that at times the threat has neither shape, beginning, edge, or character. These new threats, even as they acquire greater lethality, are often without distinct form or shape. All this places unique challenges on war fighting and the war fighter. The enemy or adversary is not clearly visible. Our responses, therefore, will have to be very watchful, very clairvoyant, insightful, underlined by, st underlined by strategic cunning, and as adept in non-kinetics as in kinetics as adept as strategic competition and operations in the gray zone, that hypothetical space between war and peace, as in full-fledged combat. Militaries will have to be equally effective both above and below the threshold. Four, and this is something that I would urge you to consider, military capacity building in terms of the optimal combination of platform systems and capacities, and not platforms alone, platform systems and capacities, even if the probability of all-out conflict is receding, military capacity building is becoming increasingly critical. It not only helps in radiating a far more effective deterrence, but sheer capacity enables the acquisition of strategic advantage and the ability to alter geostrategic realities without firing a shot. The advantages of sheer and resolute capacity building in applying coercion and achieving viable strategic military outcomes is most visible in the Taiwan situation. Do consider this. So China begins with this A280 strategy, militarizes artificial islands, deploys DF-21Ds to target American aircraft carriers, and in the fullness of time, the Americans realize that they cannot penetrate either the second island chain or even the first island chain. In fact, the CNC then, when he's asked that uh, about the military possibilities of Penetrating these island chains says that he can do it, but it will be at the cost of war. So the onus of escalation, the onus of uh, the, uh, the restoring status quo ante is shifting on the Americans. Then the Chinese carry out these increasing ADIZ infringements. The last time told, there were 56 aircraft in number. And look at the lethality of combinations. H6 bombers, Y-20s, J-16s, Y-9 EW aircraft. Y-8 Ellent aircraft. They are blockading exercises, amphibious exercises, amphibious assaults, actual amphibious assaults which threaten the peripheral islands. Missiles are fired over Taiwan with concurrent signaling to Japan. And now the Chinese have seem to have shifted in their combat philosophy from A to AD, which is we will not let you come in, to shock and awe. That means before the Americans can react, Taiwan may well be gone. The net outcome is that enhanced potency and sophistication of attacks, the higher probability of success and in advancing timelines. American professional military opinion, which used to one talk of the Taiwan contingency becoming a reality in something like 2035, is now talking of 2028, 29. So look at the overall impact. It dilutes Taipei's resolve. The government, public perception, and public opinion. American professional opinion increasingly is from one time saying that the costs of intervention will be high. Many of them quietly say that it is not worth an intervention. So when push comes to shove, will American political resolve override American professional opinion? In my view, unlikely. And when that happens, the reunification of Taiwan may become a real capacity. And how has it happened? by credible, sustained capacity building. So that is how it, it, it is important. And five, and I think General Ryan referred to this, is the rate and rapidity of change in the strategic military domain, which is stupendous. A new range of threats are moving towards us. 
such is the pace of technological evolution that if we are not sufficiently dynamic, forward-looking, and anticipatory in our thought, many of these technologies will move so far away so as to elude our grasp. Our responses, therefore, have to be steeped in high-quality ideation that thinks long-term, that thinks better, that thinks superior, is agenda-sitting and not merely reactive. Our organizational structures will need to be far more nimble, agile, and fleet-footed. Creative model of innovation and critical thinking to a new culture of energy, enthusiasm, and risk-taking. So jointmanship in the future is about this new culture, this new culture of risk-taking, innovation, critical thinking. If we are to build the critical niche capacities that will sway outcomes in future combat, so while theater commands are important, and in India this debate seems to have got stuck over theater commands, jointness for the future is much more than theater commands. All these things that I'm talking about will not happen unless there is a cultural renaissance. And as we know, culture eats structures for breakfast. Military conservatism just has to give way to a new kind of daring and entrepreneurial spirit. We will also need to create new talent pipelines and most militaries are doing it. The same old talents may not do, not merely manage existing cadres more efficiently. So what is the jointness paradigm for the new age? Given the humongous change that is sweeping the strategic military landscape to meet the challenges therein, the old metrics of jointness, which were basically about leveraging tri-service capacities in the traditional domains to optimal, optimal effect, theater commands and all of that, not that that is unimportant, but these metrics now seem somewhat lackluster and dated. The jointness debate in India, in my humble view, is still transfixed in, transfixed in conversations designed for industrial era militaries, not nestled in the opportunities and challenges of the digital age. The very ideational constituents of jointness therefore need a revisit. Only then can we evolve the nuts and bolts of a joint force for the future, one that is fit for purpose for the digital age, in terms of strategic culture, posture, and the new way of warfare. So what are or could be the military attributes for the digital age? Firstly, in terms of lexicon of phraseology, that itself is changing. Jointmanship, in my view, is now passe. As we refused to get joint in the years that we didn't, the world did not stand still. The army of the Gulf Wars 1 and 2 simply bypassed us. I think General Ahuja made a reference to the 19th 1971 war. So may I just say that 1971 was bare coordination. The phenomenal success that we got was from the persona of Sam Manekshaw, who was really a serious who never was. And what really got jointness going in the American context was, of course, Barry Goldwater Nichols of 1986, which was most popular with soldiers, sailors, and airmen, and the most unpopular with generals, admirals, and air marshals of the time. And what did it do as the effects of Barry Goldwater unfolded on ground. In Gulf War I, we saw jointmanship, bare network centricity. But by Gulf War II, as full-fledged integration came together, along with technology organizational reforms, so you had a Bradley commander who could designate an F-16 directly onto targets. Is it possible in the organizational structures that we have today? We really have to change. So it was a combination of technology and organizational reform. And as jointness ultimately evolves, it will not make a difference. Uh, the, the, the single service, uh, you know, uh, what shall I say, the brands will not make a difference. Even when the two most predominant or prominent land wars were being fought by the Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan, the CNC of CENTCOM was Admiral Mike Mullen. So that is the evolution that needs to place in jointness or, uh, uh, or integration. Today in IPACOM, IPACOM, Indo-Pacific Command, which is largely oceanic in nature, the Army signatures, the U.S. Army signatures are as large as the U.S. Navy. That is jointness. In fact, today, and today the buzzword is not jointmanship, it is not even integration, it is cross-pollination. So in our context, the Ministry of Defense should have strategic domain experts, people from the corporate world, of course, service officers, bureaucrats, scientists. That is how it has to be cross-pollination. And what, the, what China has taught to the world, what Israel has taught to the world, and now the Americans are picking up, 
is civil military fusion, which is basically the humility to acknowledge that warfare today is so complex that no service or no institution can do it on its own. So you have talent maximization with a large civilian component. In most uh, Western combatant headquarters today, the civilians and those specialists from space and cyber and all those brilliant minds are all civilian in nature. Now, if this is the trend, we honestly have to see where we are and what the long distance that we have to travel. The buzzwords today, as I said, are all domain combat proficiencies. We've spoken of this in the past, cross-pollination. I gave the example of MOD and a complete dissolution of silos. It doesn't matter what color of uniform, what background you come from, as long as you have the talent to deliver. So civil military fusion in the Indian context will be DRDO, DPSUs, the private sector, startups, entrepreneurs, scientists, academia, think tanks, all coming together in a solemn national security enterprise. And that's what the Chinese are doing. Many other militaries are doing. We have a choice. If we do not aggressively embrace these new metrics of MDO cross-pollination with other levers of power and wider government, equally important, if we do not fuse civil military talents and attributes from across the nation's workspace and stakeholders, proficiencies in digital combat will continue to elude us and the lag in the China challenge will only grow. We simply have no other option, therefore, except for an aggressive, carefully roadmapped digital embrace. The third point, I think, is what we need to do is innovate and acquire the competitive edge, innovate to acquire the competitive edge in disruptive technologies, particularly artificial intelligence. I think many of us have spoken about this in the past, but I would just like to make a reference to artificial intelligence. It's an entirely new system of knowledge and reasoning where there is first mover advantage, the winner takes it all. See, America was late in artificial intelligence and today it is gripped by major displacement anxiety, panic that it has lost the battle for technology, particularly AI to China. So time is not on our side. We've had the Pentagon software chief, Nicholas Chalon, I think resigning in October, protesting about American bureaucracies, American delays in coping up with the AI challenge. And I think just a month later, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Reference General, uh, Reference General John Hyten, made similar remarks in frustration. So if we do not act at some point in the future, we may be gripped by this displacement anxiety. It is not that we are not acting. A lot of the stuff has started, startups, private sectors and all that. But defense startups have to ride on the larger successes of the civilian startup. So what I, the point I wish to make is that Given the China challenge, given the world is changing and this whole business of joint met integration, we have a huge distance to grow. We need to exploit AI in Indian defense and at scale, scale, we have to scale it up. From chess and go, AI has now entered the domain of air-to-air -air combat. Just a few examples. The win record of AI pilots over human pilots is 99% I'm told. If this is the reality, see the distance we have to travel. The future is about May I request you to try and wind up, please. Okay, I'll just take five to three more minutes, sir. The future is about denied environments. The Chinese strategic support force in all probability will make sure that you have no GPS, you have no communications, you have no radar. What is our response to this? We keep talking about information dominance. The foundation of information dominance is electromagnetic dominance. World over now, the Americans, the Russians, are no longer talking of electromagnetic magnetic spectrum support operations, but electronic warfare maneuver, offensive use of EW as a sword arm, arm of combat operations. So there are so many of these examples to tell you that even in the technological realm, we have this whole you know, data, uh, distance to travel. The future, a joint force of the future, as or a, jo a joint force of the future, will have to stand up a digital data ecosystem for the Indian military. I don't think we made much progress there. Much of the true potential of data is unrealized. This last budget is talking all about Digital India 2.0 and all that. And they have those plans. I don't think our plans are in, you know, in a, uh, of, of, of a similar mature kind. We need to get our data pipes going, data sharing, leveraging and exploitation. We need a digital backbone with sensors, effectors and deciders plugged in. A huge proliferation in data centers. This is what integration and jointness is in the future. 
We need to create a digital service, which many militaries have done. We need to invest in information superiority because in the digital age, it will be as critical as firepower. I've spoken about, the, spoken about the cultural renaissance that we need. The theater commands, if we recreate them in the format of the industrial age, they will be of little use. Theater commands are very welcome, but they should be remodeled in the digital mold. And I'll just end up well giving you two examples of what a big challenge integration is. So the UK has set up a strategic command and the US has set up the Army Futures Command to drive integration. The mandate of the UK strategic command is that it is the lead command for integration. And this is, I think, when they integrated their MOD in 1959, they set up a CDS in 1920, they have already joined forces and ground, they are struggling with it. Look at the vision statement. It says combine effects in cyber and space with platforms and maneuvers in land, air and sea to achieve cognitive and physical effects both in overt and covert domains. Look at the emphasis on space and cyber, not as enablers, but as drivers. And who heads the UK Strategic Command? An infantry officer. Strategic Command, you know, drive integration through the length and breadth of the force, through the rank and file, that's the mandate. Develop a new understanding of the utility of force. This is the mandate. See what militaries must do in non-kinetics, military diplomacy, influence operations, so on and so forth. The US Army Futures Command, its mandate is to bring about a step change in the way of doing business in the American military. So the American military, which has gone through all that I have said, is acknowledging that in the integration domain, they have a huge distance to travel. Provide strategic guidance and unity of command to develop steered digital proficiencies. The focus on MDO and digital combat in all these domains. So as you see what the trends are, it needs to acquire much greater edge. The space and cyber, just one last point. In the US Armed Forces, the two commands that have been given combatant command status in recent times are space and cyber. Combatant command status. The SSF is, of course, a separate service. Talent pipelines, just this, I think this is the last point I'll make. Then the good example is the Israeli 8200-9300. What do they do? Realizing that the military futures are about talent, they pick up boys and girls from the best universities, put them through a tenure of five to six years, and they are free to leave. They go to Silicon Valley, connect with the IDF, and therefore, it is said that if you graduate through 8200-9300, you're as good as a Stanford graduate. So this is the effort people are making to bring in talent pipelines and the wonderful work that they did in terms of big data fusion, facial recognition, and that, that game-changing software called Alchemist was for all of us to see in the IDF offensive through the, uh, uh, against the Hamas. And one last point, I've said it so many times, but it was actually last. Why do we need to do all this? And a good example is to see what China has done to the USA vis-a-vis -vis what we could do to China. If you see the budget differentials between uh, China and USA and between India and US, uh, China, they are similar, about 3.3. Yet if what the Chinese have been doing is causing displacement anxiety to the Americans, it means that there is symmetric deterrence. What they are doing with similar budget differentials is far better. And why? Because they are ideating better, they are Taking all these steps, civil, military, fusion, so on and so forth, this cultural transformation and all that, which is getting the Americans to worry. So if we actually take some of these steps that I alluded to, then we could do much more in terms of leader development, so on and so forth. Our asymmetric deterrence or our asymmetric balancing of China will be far, far superior. That, I think, is the, should be the principal driver for us to move on this path of integration towards civil, military, fusion, digital embrace, so on and so forth. I think with these thoughts, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you, General Shukla. Uh, you've uh, given very incisive comments and uh, you very comprehend comprehensively covered the strategic, uh, the overall strategic context, the paradigm in jointness. Now, the most one of one of the very interesting things that I like, which you mentioned twice, was the issue of cultural renaissance. Well, that was that is what we require, and you very well elaborated it during your talk. Uh, 
you highlighted that the changes uh you know they don't have to be really incremental it has to be as you said a leap of faith and that the integration has to be moved by logic not by the tinkering that we seem to be doing you adequately highlighted the chinese threat uh including in the newer domains that are emerging threat from pakistan and in the cyber domain which it was highlighted that the next 911 may probably emerge in that domain and highlighting the aspect of ambiguity as a characteristic of the future domain yes there is haze there is ambiguity and that's why the military commanders probably have to start honing their skills for the tolerance of ambiguity and about the military capability building it was highlighted that it doesn't have to be only platform centric it has to be platform system and capacities building uh it was very interesting the thought that you brought the change the fear that is being evoked by change from a to ad to the shock and awe that may be implemented in the context of taiwan contingency well it's a food for thought uh you reiterated uh jal mick ryan's point of range and rapidity of change and in highlighting the joint paradigm the, the jointness paradigm you've mentioned about the long distance that we have to travel to dissolve our silos and the ecosystem that we need to create the digital ecosystem that we need to create for the battlefields of tomorrow thank you so much for your insightful comments now we've got some questions we have a short time for q and a so before taking on the question that is meant for me i will give the question to jal ryan the question for you is uh i'm sorry i don't have the name of uh, the person who's given this question but what is the role uh what are the key challenges that the militaries face when executing integration in today's multi domain operational environment the key challenges that the militaries face now this question is for you uh while you give it a thought i will give some questions that are meant for uh, general shukla now one is given the restriction or given the paucity of resources the dilemma to go in for modernization for conventional operations vis-a-vis -vis building multi domain capabilities will always remain a challenge what holds priority in the indian context given the plethora of challenges along the northern and western borders now that's one question there are more questions for you general shukla i'll come back to it later now let me take the question that is meant for me uh which is what is the role of civilian leadership in pushing the three services to work in collaboration and in integrated fashion now this question while it says what's the role of civilian leadership i presume that this question is role of political leadership in pushing the three services see we all in the three services are the professional domain experts we are the ones who understand what it entails and the onus is on the leadership of the armed forces across the services across various arms and services to be honest to ourselves and to first of all sit down and work out what is going to be 
the future battlefield environment, what would it look like? And thereafter, honestly, get on to making the architecture for that. And when we as professionals know what it entails, we can recommend it to the political leadership because the ultimate impetus has to come from them. The ultimate money, the ultimate drive, the political drive has to come from them. So I don't think there should be a need to push because it has to come from us. But if it doesn't come to us, the push may come and the push may not really come in the direction that we want. That's all. Uh, General Ryan, may I request you to take on your question, please? Yes, very quickly to answer the key challenges to integration. I think there's four. Uh, the first challenge is military culture, both within uh, the services, the different corps in army, but also between the services. Um, don't often lend themselves to working with each other as effectively as we'd like. The second challenge is uh, that I referred to in my presentation is, you know, what should be integrated? How much should be integrated? Where, when, at what level? The third challenge is the process and cultural differences between the military and other arms of national power. How do you effectively plan and execute uh, to achieve national outcomes in a more integrated way? And the fourth challenge is countering an adversary's activities that want to break down our systems and break down our integration. So we need to develop a form of integration resilience ourselves. Thank you. Now, uh, Jal Shukla, can you please uh, take on your question? Multi-domain operations. I would just like to offer a comment on you know, who's really to blame for us not moving forward. For a long time, at least in my younger years, the blame was squarely on the political class. It, that did seem that the military was always wanting more. The political class was very hesitant to concede to that change. Of late, it does seem that the onus is equally on us. Political class is demanding greater change and we cannot get our act together. And it is not peculiar to the Indian system. I would I picked this phrase from the talk of the the commander of the US First Futures Command. And look what he says. He says, what worries me most is this burgeoning purpose gap. What the digital battlefields of the future demand and what legacy US Army leaders are delivering. So it's for everybody to step up to the challenge. It's no longer this political class, three stars. In fact, in the newer domains, the younger generation comes with a natural digital fluency. It is for us, the middle and senior leaders, to step up to it because we don't quite understand it. The need for this digital change and everybody has to be introspective in this. I mean, this was just one comment I wanted to make. The question for me is, given the restriction on resources, the, the dilemma to go in for modernization preparations, for conventional operations vis-a-vis -vis MDO will always remain, what holds priority? See, the point is this, do we need additional budgets? Of course we need. And I made that whole point about capacity building, what sheer capacity building does. So capacity building is equally important. But there is no conflict between multi-domain and conventional operations. In fact, they complement each other. Today, and I think this is the change that we need to make, we have for very long thought space and cyber are enablers. They are not. In fact, today, if you ask, what does Northern Command need most? It needs from awareness, it needs space for targeting. You need it for PNT, everything. And look where the debates are going. The US Spacecom boss is saying that while China is looking at outer space, we are looking at bare space. So they will lead us in the domain. So that is their fear. Point is that this whole, why should the UK has stood up a space command, the US has stood up a space command, made it a separate service, made it a combatant command. The US Cybercom boss was explaining that 2016 elections, he, the then com, the, uh, the co commander read about the Russian hacking from the newspapers. 2020, because the mandate now came to him, they secured the elections. And that's connected to the next question, you know, about cyber crime and all. In America also, this debate was who should get cyber? Who will protect the private sector spaces, the business? 
And many people argued on the other issues of, you know, transparency, this, that, that it should not be the U.S. cyber call. But the threat of cyber was so overwhelming that today, even securing the business in the private sector, their cyber domains are the U.S. cyber com, U.S. cyber com. There's other this debate, you know, whether you will get talent or not. I was surprised. I think it was the U.S. space com boss, he said, that while the big tech companies were suffering talent attrition, people were leaving. They were not leaving space and cyber com, even they were because they, though they were paying one-tenth salaries because of the the, what shall I say, the prestige associated with strategic projects. So the younger generation were coming to these. So in some, I would say that all these are, there are opportunities and there are challenges. There are many opportunities of going forward and they are challenges. But there are consequences of not acting. If you don't act, the world is not standing still. I gave you the example of RMA has bypassed us. If we don't get together, the digital embrace may also bypass us. And I think what we must really see that the city street in India is moving much. The health sector is talking of a digital back backbone. Everybody is talking. We don't seem to be talking about it. So we really need, you know, in all these domains, because of the fulsome opportunities, we need to act fast and get over these debates. So you need a cultural change which acknowledges that the debate is not about all this. See, on a lighter note, we know that, uh, you know, when you end these arguments, somebody will draw you aside and say, yeah, they put, all this is good English. But tell me, your 23 appointments and is key. I am saying, though, the debate has moved beyond that. It is not about that. There are huge payoffs of moving forward. And for many of the issues I highlight, so that's my answer to the question. MDO, conventional operations, they will all complement each other. Space capacities available on the Northern Front will be as useful in the Western Front. So we really have to grow this up. And now there is an opportunity with the space com and all coming in. Also, we have to see what trends are. The trends are today the partner of the U.S. space com is not DARPA. It is Elon Musk. In India, there are many private sector professionals who are coming forth. We must take them. And there are many, you know, variations. You don't really need, don't need those big rockets. I'm told today you need three vehicles. One launch vehicle, one some vehicle and all. All this is very much doable if we make that cultural change. In all these domains, a lot has changed. A lot is happening. But my whole argument it needs to happen at a much faster pace because the world is not waiting. For it. So that's my answer to these questions. And there was one more question. If whether measuring global balance of power needs analytical precision as traditional quantitative measurement does not account for qualitative improvements that enhance power of states. I know it's a little uh, oh, oh, differently worded question. If uh, oh, the person asking question is sitting in the hall, could he please clarify this? What he's trying to say is that our usual quantitative measures of drawing balance between uh, our orbats and uh, between the weapons and equipments that we hold is uh, not really accurate in today's context. Do we need a different way of evaluating different nations inter se par? I think that's the essence of the question. Uh, one more question that has come from the Chanakya Hall that's addressed to General Shukla. The focus of our hierarchy is still on the force on force ratios and land centric border disputes with China. What institutional measures do you recommend to actually transform from force centric approach to a digital approach? Uh, is it something on this line that you are saying? But there is a question that I've got here at hand, which says there, and we'll request Jan Shukla to answer that. Thereafter, we'll close the session. Oh, fine. Sir. I think uh, that covers the, that will cover the essence of what this questionnaire has also asked. Yes. Okay. Well, the second question, sir, I will just say that in the last two to three years, last two to three years, the army has made great efforts. I can talk for the army, Ravne and uh, track. See, uh, let me give you one example about technology. Two to three years back, I think the army was a technology laggard. It is no longer so. We have taken huge measures and see what measures have been taken. Firstly, this 
the ADB, the Army Design Bureau, was set up by Chanan, currently Kirti Johar and all. It's a huge success. The, the great, uh, shall I say, value that startups have brought to this whole defense ecosystem has surprised me. You saw that from drone swarming to exoskeletons to robotics, all this business has kicked off. You know, low light imagery, I can give you examples by the dozen. Our track, which was supposed to set up to the R&D for this business, year before last, the expenditure was zero. Last year was nine crores. This year it is 132 crores. 132 crores in all the, in all these. So that, that will give you an indication of that is happening. And of course, it's in concert with ADB and all these. We are saying things like, which were never said in the past, that even if you fail, we'll fund you. When I say risk-taking, this is risk-taking. Even if you fail, we'll fund you. All these measures are there, a host of measures, and we pick this up from global trends, what is happening here, there, and the other. And what it has done most, that it has brought this innovation, energy, dynamism into this, and it's a good competition for the DRDO and the DPSUs to smart. So in the technology sphere, technology sphere, this is all that we've done. All the other issues that we are talking of, non-kinetics, what should we do? What is our response to the strategic support? It's information dominance, not just a, a cliche, but what, what does it mean? Do we need to set up in response? All these things have started, but they will take time to take, take root. So we are focusing greatly on non-kinetics and all these uh, other domains. That first question about power. See, let me just say this. I couldn't really get what the question was, but yet two thoughts come to my mind. Last four to five years, it does seem that no matter what your power construct is, the instrument, all nations which are doing well, the instrument of force is figuring very prominently in that. And that is, uh, I think it was uh, any contrarian thought to this of the past must disappear. And the instrument of force potency doesn't mean that you jackboot around the world, but you use it to pursue your interest where it is required. And I think that is also one huge change which has come out, come about because of CDS, DMA and all that, where it is acknowledged that the instrument of force matters. And I will just round up by saying the biggest example came from the pandemic, where the conclusion seems to me that today everything is national security, which began as a health event, ended up as a national security crisis. Few months into the pandemic, you saw the brutal geopolitics flowing out. You see what happened in the South China Sea along the LAC and all that, which means that these all these silos once again health, diplomacy, foreign affairs, all this must go. And we all must need to come together in this. Here too, I would say the interactions between the Ministry of External Affairs and all have improved greatly. They have improved greatly from the past, but the challenge that is posed to us specifically from China, we still need to go along. Yes, we have one last pressing question for General Rayan by Major General Atul Rawat, a brief one. Uh, sir, my question to General Ryan is, sir, that in last about four to five years, we have seen a number of multi-domain operations executed by China on Australia itself. Uh, from the earlier uh, uh, good friendship that the two countries enjoyed, over a period of time, we have found that on the diplomatic front, on the economic front, uh, so much so, uh, so the influence operation on the local ethnic uh, Australian Chinese who are there and the political influence itself. So whole range of multi-domain operations are being, uh, I would say, launched on Australia. How is Australia reacting as whole of the nation approach uh, in general and military in particular? Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. I, I, I guess in many respects, that's a question for politicians and government, but in general, uh, the country has reacted quite stiffly. Um, the uh, annual Lowy Institute poll that looks at Australian perceptions of different countries has changed markedly uh, with China over the last two years with its co coercive activities. Um, and largely uh, the coercive activities uh, probably haven't achieved what they sought uh, from the political level, but also 
as an example to other countries. I would hope our nation is an example that stands up for what it believes in, uh, stands up for uh, the values of democracy that we collectively believe in, and is an example to other countries that they can stand up to um, without being overwhelmed uh, by the coercive activities that have gone on. Uh, thank you, General Ryan. And uh, we are, let me conclude this session now by thanking my co panelists, General Ryan and General Raj Shukla. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. And now we come to the end of this session. Thank you.